while we do have geopolitical clout and we have clout as a country one of the criticisms we get is are we becoming an extremist hindu nation do you think the congress is strong opposition i think the congress is the only national party on the other side we will help you we will make your life easier and we will support you the way a government should public narrative like when big politicians are giving speeches we should be highlighting entrepreneurship education etc and it should reflect in the policies we need something like that how to bring our political gods down to earth do you feel that your safety is compromised when you talk so openly the people around me feel that have you ever suggested all this to government officials or politicians like everything that you're saying on this podcast is this the first time you're publicly saying these things <sighs> Welcome to part 2 of our epic Dr Raghuram Rajan conversation on TRS. I do recommend that you should watch part 1 if you're tuning into this episode but you know what this particular episode is more about the politics of 2024 as well as certain projected future trends. It's said that in business you need to listen to what your country's government is saying and our government is pointing all the entrepreneurs towards the manufacturing sector. Dr. Raghuram Rajan has contradicting views to the mainstream view. So of course we broke down all of that. We broke down the dynamics of 2024 and there's a lot of conversation related to religion and secularism as well. And before I let you slip into today's special episode I do recommend that you check out Sir's book. It's called Breaking the Mold. It'll teach you a lot about the same concepts that he's spoken about in both these conversations. But for now, I'll let you slip into part two of our epic conversation with the former RBI Governor, Dr. Raghuram Rajan. Welcome to part two of the special conversation. So part one was about economics, about understanding that subject. Part two is about the more practical side of things. Twenty twenty four is an election year. Uh, manufacturing, it's a word that's thrown around a lot. Uh, China, lots of other topics will be covered on this particular episode. But for now, welcome back, Doctor Raghuram Rajan. Thanks for having me again. I'm really trying to humanize you through this conversation as well because I feel like you're a bit too much of an icon in the public eye. Are you aware of that icon status a little bit? Not really, but uh, I mean, I guess uh, uh, all of us get uh, requests for selfies when we. <laughs> I'm sure you get a lot yourself. Yeah, I'm sure people get very intimidated around you, just because of the aura that your name holds. Well, I, I they don't uh, ask me questions after the can I take a selfie? So maybe that's 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 a reflection of that. But I hope there's not not any aura. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to talk to a lot of people of your stature with the experience that you've had because there's a lot that people pick up not just from the words you're saying, but people consume podcasts because they can kind of gauge what's in between the lines as well. Right. people know the intention from where thoughts come out which is the whole point of this so before we move on to our conversations about governance administration economics once again it's a simple question i have for you what do you do to chill and i because to yeah. be someone like yourself you have to be a lifelong student and i'm assuming that even your chilling has a little bit of studying in it well <laughs> so chill chill yeah i i play squash i play tennis and uh in summer i cycle um uh so those are I, and i run uh so those are various forms of uh, chilling i try and do something every day you lift weights uh i do okay. uh but that not not to become a not buff like you <laughs> but uh just to keep my muscles uh, reasonable right. um I, i do read uh i mean i just I have fun reading but i read a fair amount of fiction also so it's not that i'm reading uh, economics textbooks all the time uh it's i mean right now i'm reading a book on aging <laughs> and uh you know what new discoveries are being made to push off aging i'm also reading a a book about a young witch so <laughs> it's all kinds 
Gotcha. I would assume you have this little den in your house with all these stats, graphs, and economic textbooks. But you're just no. a normal guy. No, just a normal. Guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Coming back to our overarching conversation, we were talking about job creation, the role of entrepreneurship. Uh, I do wish to talk to you about manufacturing in detail yes. because it has become an Indian internet thing. Yeah. But before we get into that, I want to talk about election season. Yeah. As well as from a very detached perspective, I wish to talk a little bit about religion. Right. You know, I think when people talk about religion from an emotional perspective, those conversations are also great. Right. As long as the emotions are positive. Right. <laughs> the moment you kind of bring in negative emotions into right. conversations about religion, right. when it becomes about me versus you, right. that's where those conversations get ugly. Right. But religion has a lot to give a Absolutely. human mind, soul journey. Of but it's also a very sharp political weapon. Yes. It can be used to control the masses. Yes. Uh, and I think that's what you were saying in your previous point, that perhaps all over the world now, uh, while we do have geopolitical clout and we have clout as a country, one of the criticisms we get is, are we becoming an extremist Hindu nation? Would you like to say anything about yeah, this? Yeah, I, I, I think the... The problem to some extent is the dialogue is hijacked by the extremists of each religion. And each religion has its extremists. Yes. And I think the problem then comes that they point fingers at each other. And uh, I mean, no religion practices or preaches intolerance and least of all Hinduism. And you said you're a practicing Hindu. I'm a practicing Hindu. I, I do believe that our philosophy is, is a fantastic one. I'm not saying to the exclusion of other philosophies, but I, I do think I feel very comfortable when I read the Gita, and and I think it's uh, it's uh, wisdom for 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 the ages. That said, I mean I also think that as a country, um, religion is just one aspect. And as you said, I mean when you look back to the founding fathers, we spend a long time sort of reading some of what they were talking about then in the Constitutional Assembly and so on. I mean we were shaken by the incidence of partition. But we also were very firm that we didn't be, want to be an Indian Pakistan. Mm. They were a theological-driven country. We did not want to be that. We wanted room for all religions. Uh, and, and I think that is a very noble, but also very far-seeing view that... This is why the idea of Bharat or the idea of India is different. We have place for everyone and we will treat everyone equally. That's important. Whether you're social, anti-social, we will treat you equally, not based on your religion. And, and I, that is a firm sort of, that was my mother, my father sort of ingrained that in my, in my, in my beliefs. And I think that's very worth fighting for, to preserve that India, which is a land of equal opportunity, equal treatment for every one of its people. In a sense, it's a microcosm of how we want the world to be. That by all means, you have traditions, you have um, a, a history, um, but also uh, you have a culture of uh, of bringing people together. Uh, we want a world like that, not a world which is constantly fighting for space. I think the one truth I've learned about careers is that if you become someone of value and if you're friendly, it's a very potent combination for growth on an individual level. It is also at the national level. And this is the lesson we should learn from China. China was successful. And then China decided to flex its muscles and say, we're better than you. Pick quarrels with all its neighbors. And it also, you know, uh, was threatening to the West. What did they do? They started fighting back. What you don't want to do is create that kind of antagonism. I, I'm not saying, you know, take everything. Push back. But there are ways of pushing back respectfully. I did it all my life in the West. I've pushed back and said, no, this will not do. And if you do it, as you said, politely, and you have, uh, I mean, I have been critical of the Western system. I was, I was speaking to the IMF board just last week. 
the board managing director asked me, uh, along with a historian, to talk about what was wrong with the IMF. And they were willing to. And I said, here are the things that are wrong. You are not doing what the emerging markets need. You need to improve. And you need to change your system. But I didn't do it saying you have the wrong intention. I said, look, we can. this can improve. If you don't, you will become a sideshow. That message can be delivered in a you know, reasonable way where it actually improves conversation without being antagonistic. And I think this is what we should strive as a country, uh, you know, learn as uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, former foreign secretary, has said, perhaps China flexed its muscles too quickly. Let's not think that is the only way. We can grow. But I, I think even as a poor country, we were heard around the world because our values were respected. This is a country which is trying to be inclusive, trying to take people along. And I think we can send that message again. Um, the underlying discussion here is about how a politician's life contains two parts. One is the part that leads up to the election and one is the part which is related to administration. When you're talking about the part that leads up to the election and we're in the middle of that part right now for so many politicians, you need to know how to talk to the masses' hearts and the easiest way to do that is religion. I think what you're trying to say is that public narrative, like when big politicians are giving speeches, we should be highlighting entrepreneurship, education, etc. And it should reflect in the policies. So that's the technocrat's view. And obviously there is the politician. It's their role to emphasize what tugs at people's hearts. Mm. And, and I think, you know, Gandhi managed to be a religious man in his in his in his personal life in his outlook but also preached secularism uh, you know an open house and he was very successful at that love not hate i think you need to combat emotion with emotion wow. facts with facts and i think what we're looking for is some politician who will offer us the alternative to hate and divisiveness, which is love and decency. We've sort of forgotten that decency is so important in public life. You should not be focused on putting each other in jail. You should be focused on having a dialogue about your policies, which allows for the country to have better policies over time. The worst that can happen to the country is to have one party and no opposition. That's what happened in the, you know, in the 70s and it didn't take us very far. Do you feel that's happening now as well? I think we're trending towards that. And I think we're trending for the wrong reasons, not because most of the country wants it, but because the organizations of, uh, of power, the organs of power are being used in such a fashion. Can you expand that thought? I mean, look, how many uh, politicians are coming into line <laughs> Uh, because the uh, weapons of the state are being used against them, right? How many politicians suddenly find that the cases against them go away when they change sides? Uh, you know, I think this is not uh, an effective uh, democracy if this, this expands. Uh, I think that if you look at countries which have done this, uh, Hungary, um, um, Russia, uh, Turkey, uh, their, I mean, eventual uh, sort of uh, outcome is not a good one. We have to guard against it. Uh, and I think what we need, regardless of this election, is a strong opposition. Uh, not because, you know, uh, of anything else, other than the only way we can get good policy is by having effective debate. And the only way we can get effective debate is by having people who are willing to call out the ruling party. Do you think the Congress is strong opposition? I don't want to pick a particular party. I think the Congress is the only national party on the other side. 
I, I certainly think that uh, it's trying to develop a, a, a alternative agenda. But I think for the sake of the country, I hope that 2024 uh, is uh, a, a place where we have enough. The election is one where we have a lot of debate about policies, counter policies, that the public becomes much more informed and we have an election which reflects the views of the country. It might be a rudimentary opinion, but I don't see that happening. That's what we all have to fight for. Uh, that's why I write this book to uh, with Rohit, uh, obviously my, my co-author. We're trying to energize a debate, um, you know, not just about the economics, but also about the politics. What is the country that will take India towards being a developed country? What, 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 is, the, what is the state? What is the nature of the country? And I don't see a authoritarian um, country uh, uh, reaching anywhere near developed status um, in the next 20, 25 years. You know, so a general corporate rule is that if you're giving feedback to any teammate, you first begin with positive feedback. You say yes. that, hey, this is what you've done right. Right. And this is what I think you can do better. Yes. It's a very general rule that I assume that everyone knows, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, so to summarize this whole discussion that we've had, I'd love for you to highlight a few positives that the current government has done and then give a big feedback section also. You can decide the length of both. <laughs> no, <laughs> let, let, let me be quick because I... I so on the positives, I, I think certainly a couple that I already highlighted, uh, streamlining the benefits transfer system so as to reduce leakage in the process, um, the uh, improvement in infrastructure, um, I think the uh, trying to ensure that the ministries function and don't hold up things unnecessarily, uh, that's 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 a third uh, sort of improvement. Comes from having a very strong center and uh, a prime ministerial office which cares very much about about all this. Those are uh, you know very strong positives, and that's that's uh, that's good. Uh, negatives. I would. I would just start with the uh, whole majoritarianism, which, whether encouraged or not discouraged, I mean, you can pick not discouraged. Which pick whichever uh, you want. Um, I think the that, to my mind, uh, strikes at the very soul of India, and and I think that's that's deeply problematic. I think the uh, the other aspects I would say is is much more of a focus on jazzy stuff and much less of a focus on getting the fundamentals right. Yes, education is a state subject, but we should, uh, the center and the state collaborate on so much, the central educational institutions. We need far more of an investment in them. Uh, we need many more IITs, many more IIMs, but we also need top quality institutions in the countries, uh, f five, six in the top 100. This needs a lot of investment. We've been talking about a National Research Foundation for years. We're still talking about it. Uh, maybe it's coming closer to being implemented, but still at too small a scale. We need far more research and so on. So th the priorities uh, seems to be more on the hard stuff. Uh, what I mean by hard stuff is hardware, uh, roads, airports, etc. Much less on the soft stuff which is the education, healthcare, uh, working with the states to remedy that. So that's one. Second, too much centralization. Too many decisions taken, not just in the center, but within the prime minister's office so that the ministries are to some extent looking up always for order. We're always looking up to see what, what they're thinking. Uh, but the, the third, uh, uh, I think, um, I mean, aspect I mean, or related aspect to this is a, a centralization away from the states. Uh, the states don't have enough space to do uh, uh, what, what what they need to. I think, you know, that's, uh, those are some of the downsides I, I see, which, uh, you know, put them all together. Um, uh, you said we'll come to talking about manufacturing. There's this little bit of a overemphasis on manufacturing as the way to to progress, a little too much willingness to listen to industrialists and a little too much favoring 
certain industrialists, all of which I think complicate the process of getting a comparative economy uh, going. So that's that's I think um, another aspect that I would I, I would fault. So I you know three three problems, uh, three downsides, three upsides. I think that's pretty balanced. Yeah. Ah, uh, fair. Uh, before we move into that whole manufacturing section, which is the baby of the Indian internet right now, I want to ask the economist in you this question. So the question I want to ask you is that when you're building, say, something like the Statue of Unity, the pro side argument, the argument for it is that when you build it up, it's able to make back the money in over the next five year span, but then that statue will stay for really long and therefore the income generated in that area will increase. Look, I, I'm i not overly worried about building statues and buildings. I worry about it when it becomes more a uh, um, edifice complex. Uh, the pharaohs of Egypt built pyramids uh, they didn't build it for the tourism that would come uh, later on. There wasn't a cost-benefit analysis like that. It was, I want to be known for building these big buildings. And then you tend to overdo them. Mm. Tend to, there's no cost-benefit analysis. I mean, look at what's happening in Egypt right now. Uh, Mr. Sisi, their president, is in trouble. Why? Because he has invested enormous amounts in this new city, which is some... Uh, distance from Cairo, it's going to be a new, but it's absorbed an enormous amount of government funding. And the government is now, you know, essentially bankrupt. Uh, similar things happened in Malaysia, uh, in East Asia, when uh, Malaysia was, was the poster child of trying to build a new capital city and so on. Um, I think you have to be a little careful about too much uh, building buildings for the future, which are have no immediate use but are you know going to become tourist destinations. Um, some, not bad, and maybe it builds up national spirit. Too many, uh, and it becomes a um, you know monument to you rather than a monument that the nation can benefit from. At the end of the day, we're all boys and girls who are trying to showcase our own might in this little world. Right. So I think when that feeling becomes overdone, right. that's when it can become a problem. Right, right. I think that, so I'm, I'm not against. What I do think is we are a nation with limited resources. So we need to constantly ask, where is this money going, right? And, you know, one of the things we highlight in the book is what is our, what should be our biggest source of shame? You know, so many things to feel proud of. Our biggest source of shame, I would argue, is the fact that 35% of our children have malnutrition, even today. That is a number which is worse than a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. How can that be? How can we allow that? When in fact the answers, the solutions are well known. And it's not that Indian kids are different and therefore when you look at the same kids in the UK, they're perfectly well nutritioned. Because malnutrition is going to hurt us not just today, but 20 years from now when these kids join the labor force. If they haven't been able to study, think, learn, because their brains are not as well developed, because their body is not as well developed, it's going to hurt us. How can we permit this? We should be bringing this, if there's one project mode, uh, sort of um, uh, project we should engage in, it is this. And measure it district by district, month, you know, year by year, how many kids are in this situation? and tackle it. And the solutions are well-known. They're, they're well-known solutions in the rest of the world which tackled it in project mode. So the solution in this case is you study another part of the world where this problem existed and then was solved and then apply it in India. You can do that. You can also look at places where we've been successful in bringing it down within the country okay. and ask what did they do and apply those best practices. But we need to do this. We How can we be satisfied that we are making progress when we don't tackle this most difficult but but uh, horrible of, of problems. What's the roadblock? I don't know. I mean, the reality is government attention, you know, depends on where government's attention is. Again, human angles here. Yeah. Human angles. Like where does your emotion naturally flow into? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, um, 
right i i think that's that's a sufficient explanation <laughs> so effectively you're never truly criticizing policy you're criticizing human beings one is never criticizing policy one is criticizing human beings i mean ultimately so the marxists would say your policies are driven by the technology and the attitudes and and you're you're sort of a prisoner of all that but i would say there's human agency uh depending on who sort of leads and what their attention is on you get different outcomes my highly optimistic and definitely innocent standpoint on this is that the entrepreneurs have the answers and we just need to breed many 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 more entrepreneurs in our country i, I think they do but but government has a role also right because some of these things there is no payoff for an entrepreneur now if you're talking about social entrepreneurs yes Uh, and there are plenty of them in this country also who are trying to do different noble things on the social side without necessarily looking for a profit but there may not be much profit immediately for somebody to rescue a child from malnutrition but there's a very great urgency for a government to ensure that really a very very small number of children suffer from it so here's my dream scenario right like i feel like my generation of entrepreneurs who've seen some successful bootstrap businesses will eventually do more businesses in life sell to the world make a lot of money and dedicate their life post age 50 or 60 to actually helping solve the nation's problems that exist in say the 2040s and 50s that's the dream scenario and mostly all the entrepreneurs that i do meet even now who are on the same track are thinking along these lines that there's no point of entrepreneurship if it doesn't lead to some kind of social impact yeah but but uh, the solution you're proposing is 20 years from now yes when these guys <laughs> we need a solution today because these problems will get entrenched 20 years from now i mean one of the worries we have to have is that if we don't find jobs for all the millions who are coming into the labor force the crores who are coming to the labor force what we have is conflict i mean think about what's happening in manipur uh at the face of it is metis and cookies but in reality it's also about access to jobs reservations who gets reservations who gets those benefits because there are too few private jobs going around if private jobs were plentiful who would care about government jobs and there was a time we were seeing a lot of private jobs coming in in the liberalization the f- uh, 90s and the early 2000s somehow we've run out of steam we need a new generation of reforms that enable that job creation right so i mean i think that uh, we need answers today now we need answers also for the medium term so that's where your your answer comes in that we need to enable the kind of entrepreneurship that creates those answers but we we need immediate answers we need medium term answers we need long term answers and i think there is a role for the private sector in in all three but there has to be attention paid to this on a war footing um again this whole conversation that we've had and we're entering that last rung of the conversation where we'll talk about manufacturing so but everything that we've spoken about boils down to education and entrepreneurship for me like that's what i've gained from this whole conversation that almost all of the nation's problems can be solved through these two no i look i i would say I, I, let me not minimize the role of government that the government can be a disabler or an enabler and what we need is an enabling government which will you know allow all these forces uh to play a role and that requires a government which places the right priorities on these different issues uh but also creates the the right framework the right environment and you know uh i think if you have all those elements now some of that and that's that's what's important that's again what we write about in the book it requires actual change in the nature of government that without that uh we may find it hard policies don't just happen policies have to be incentivized and if government is of a certain sort those kinds of policies don't get incentivized so how do we incentivize the right policies you know you said education how do we incentivize much more of a focus on getting education right on getting health care right on getting nutrition right and that requires also some deep rooted changes in the, the nature of our government 
have you ever suggested all this to government officials or politicians like everything that you're saying on this podcast mm. is this the first time you're publicly saying these things no i i i've said it uh, for some time the the book is a way of putting it together in a coherent way so people see all the pieces together why is why are you saying this why are you saying that how does it fit together and i think once you see all of that then you say aha okay this is a model uh which which is uh worth looking at now you can of course pick and choose with from within the model but we're saying it all hangs together you miss staying in india i come back so often i'm here every 3 months uh i i have a lot of friends um i i talk to a lot of people i actually work with the tamil nadu government so uh i'm engaged um uh, i work with a u- university uh, kriya university which we founded 4 years ago uh so i i feel that i still am 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 doing something useful here i want to congratulate you on your new found passion as well which is podcasting <laughs> <laughs> well uh i you know what i'm fascinated by is what reach the podcasts have Uh, and certainly yours is is uh, one of the kings amongst them and i have to say i am just impressed uh, and this is let me hasten to say this is not to flatter you but uh, i'm just impressed at the professionalism that uh, people like you bring to the job uh, it, it truly I, every time i look at young people in india and see what they can do and i used to have this again feeling at the rbi the the young just rise to the occasion we just have to give them a chance and you guys are showing that i mean how are you creating a whole new industry and i you know i have never been asked the kinds of questions you're asking and and that that reflects both your sense of fearlessness but i mean i think your your courage is 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 part of that but also this is a new medium you're not dependent on the old purse strings and hopefully it'll stay that way also the old purse strings are not liking this new medium a lot of it hmm? well so. i hope that we preserve the space for this and and i keep saying it is in the government's interest to hear it from somewhere because if it doesn't hear it it will not know how to change it's exactly what i feel the section i was going to head into was about courage i was going to ask you how you feel about voicing all these things like in terms of do you feel that your safety is compromised when you talk so openly um there are people around me who feel uh who feel that um i still have faith in this country <laughs> same and and i feel that hopefully there's an innate decency you know in in a, almost a, everyone that uh, we see the need for this uh and and i think i mean you said earlier uh, it's important for a few voices to be saying these things uh, to preserve the sense of of everyone that there could be change because when those voices are silenced that's when you you feel the hopelessness you feel the sense that there will not be change that's when bad things can start happening yeah um everything that i've learned about navigating through life i've learned through content creation and the internet uh, i've seen too many content creators come and go and in almost all cases it was because they were surrounded by yes men or yes women who just agreed with like whatever they were doing the ones who consciously surrounded themselves with people who challenged them actually survived and then grew uh, i think this is a very standard playbook for any business owner any industry etc etc uh i do believe we live in the time which is filled with echo chambers as we spoke about previously uh I also believe that even the government at the end of the day is run by humans who have a similar kind of lifestyle as the average person in terms of they're consuming social media they're looking at twitter they're going through youtube podcasts therefore they are also part of this echo chamber problem now those human beings are letting their own minds dictate their policy decisions 
therefore one it's important for all of them to surround themselves with people who are not yes men and i would argue that many of them already have the fact that they've risen to power over the course of their life says a lot about where they are but at every stage you have to allow your humility to come back in order to grow to the next stage so personally one practice that we've brought about on this show i'll tell you where this came about as well thank you for giving me so much space to talk sir but it's just learnings that i'm sharing so we did four bjp politicians back to back last year because the opportunity came up now as a content creator i'm getting to talk to dr jay shankar smriti irani piyush goyal uh chandra shekhar so it's it's not something i'm going to let go of i did all four we released them we were criticized by everyone who was anti modi saying that oh now are you the new spokesperson for the government you're just like the news channels etc etc when we brought the congress and ab politicians no one spoke about that mm. no one even watched those episodes mm. uh so the narrative out there right now is that i'm extremely pro modi but the truth is i am just seeking truth through these conversations right uh now my my angle here is that the solution we uh brought about was see i'm talking to these four people and they were my first four political conversations now of course the inputs to me will affect the way i look at the world and the same with the congress and aap stuff so you're constantly in a battle with echo chambers around you mm-hmm. it's just the nature of content creation we've hired a team within office whose job is to just criticize my creative team constantly including sentences we use including build up to questions uh and including opinions that i put forward uh and to the degree when if say there is a strong opinion that's put forward we'll try scheduling a guest who's at the extreme polar opposite of that opinion mm. and this has worked like magic but my point is i feel like the government needs to have some sort of a body that's built into their process whose job is to just bring forward all the criticism that is being spoken about them you know there used to be um in the triumphs that a roman general used to have there used to be a slave holding a laurel wreath over his head to show glory but whispering in his ear that he was merely a mortal oof that he was not a god in a sense what you're saying is we need something like that how to bring you know our gods down to earth our political gods down to earth but as important you know many organizations have a evaluation office which basically is independent and evaluates the programs you know you said you had a toilet program did it really uh, roll out as you said is it used as you said do we have 100% defecation free it has to be independent otherwise it's not credible but it gains information which then allows you to you know improve your 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 performance we need much more of that there was a talk way back of the planning commission now the niti aayog having an independent evaluation office and of course that died uh but it would be good to have some something like that to evaluate government programs because typically only government has the data but you need it to be independent uh and to be perceived to be independent and uh, you know to share with the uh with the opposition also all the data but i think something like that would be useful i'm very much like your sense of having a unit within your organization which is going to look at all the verbiage and then get back to you and say this won't work or this will work even ronaldo needs a coach absolutely like you need someone to tell you where you're going right. wrong right if you want to stay ronaldo if you want to stay ronaldo exactly again it's when we think we are fantastic we make the mistakes um again i'm just relaying real experience yo i had a lot of fun spending time in nitin gadkari's office because i saw how he runs the show and it's a very team oriented it's a lot of sports strategy it's his own u- unit of guys from nagpur mainly and when we credit nitin gadkari for infrastructure development i feel it's that full team which is at play uh, and i had a lot of conversations with them as well just just to understand what's going right in that ministry mm-hmm. because i hear a lot of even uh, the congress side's political commentators praising praising nitin gadkari so there's something correct that of that course. man and his team are doing um I got team mentality. I got a lot of humility from mm. Nitin Gadkari ji. Like I enjoyed that conversation mm. a lot. Uh in your eyes what do you think he's doing right? And if right. there was someone else in his place 
uh, for the roads and transportations ministry would that person also be doing a job that's as good or like is he is he just benefiting from being in that ministry or it's no, it's his I I have immense respect for him I I think he's a very very um you know has done wonders in his job he's obviously um sort of very focused on pushing that he was earlier also i if i recollect transportation minister in the in the uh, vajpai government and uh, did a did a good job there so he has experience he uh, obviously uh, knows how to push forward the 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 whole uh, scheme and i think you know he's one of the most open and uh, you know um, ministers in the government and willing to discuss and um, you know i uh, i mean i think we need more such ministers he took the criticism head on like in he kept jostling with me through the conversation but at one point when i asked him i think about himachal floods or there was something i asked him about he's like this is completely on me this is not even on yeah you know the himachal state yeah. this is my fault yeah. and i take responsibility yeah. and i hope to correct it yeah, yeah. that kind of statement connects to the youth right like because people are able to gauge a lot yeah i look I, i think i think we tend to forget that i mean i thought the nda government under mr vajpayee was was very good uh, in the years it was in power uh, especially on the economic front i thought mr yashwant sinha was one of the best finance ministers we have had in what he was pushing i actually worked with uh, with that nda government i worked with mr yashwant sinha uh, and uh, i think Uh, what they did was a lot of reforms uh, including the infrastructure build out the golden quadrilateral what didn't happen for them was strong growth until the end of their their time they weren't lucky enough to get that growth in real time but they had done the reforms with and the growth then emerged in the next few years until the global financial crisis uh, torpedoed growth but i think that was a very strong government and some of the people you are uh, you know like mr gadkare uh, but uh, there were others who were you know important parts of the government you know what you want is a band of equals uh, who can take uh, you know the country forward who are you know reasonably comfortable with each other who can debate who can jostle who can this thing of course there's the prime minister who is the first amongst equals but what you need is uh, you know strong people in every ministry that to my mind would be the ideal um, you know structure for india ah uh, now sir we'll talk about the highlight of this episode which is manufacturing um the only person also if you say manufacturing is a highlight lot of people will tune <laughs> off <laughs> it's see i relay the audience's questions right and the data tells us yeah, that yeah, yeah. Uh, people are very interested in this manufacturing based conversation yeah yeah, yeah. uh why because one of the understandings about improving your entrepreneurial skills is that you listen to what the government is saying right in your country the government is encouraging young people to get into the world of manufacturing yeah. so i've tried approaching the same conversation from multiple angles right. uh the only two slightly altering viewpoints that i found are one yours yeah. uh which and we'll come to that we'll expand that whole thought the second was from balaji shrinivasan yeah. who's one of the leading twitter uh, content creators in the world he's one of the most respected vcs uh, yeah. who's come out of silicon valley and he's one of the sharpest speakers as well as one of the deepest thinkers that i have come across on the show yeah. he said that what people don't account for is that robotics and ai will be a big part of manufacturing going forward so a lot of the pro arguments and the counter arguments like for and against manufacturing do not account for the robotics and ai angle that is going to be a part of it um uh, now keeping what he said in mind as a bit of a flag post in this conversation so i'll let you expand on this conversation that you've had in many of your interviews about how you're not as bullish on the manufacturing sector because the current viewpoint is a lot of first time entrepreneurs who have made some money who have figured out how to create businesses are now thinking of getting into manufacturing full time right uh by just learning about the industry yeah go for it so so i think first to put my cards on the table i am not against manufacturing i think manufacturing is an important part of what india will do going forward what i'm against is fetishizing manufacturing saying that's the only way to grow and 
thereby underemphasizing other ways of growing such as what you are doing you are performing a service which is growing which has grown really well and is providing a good that many people consume right and if you look at india's history in the recent past where we have grown in terms of jobs is services not manufacturing manufacturing has been declining despite all the efforts of the government now i'm not saying don't have manufacturing what i'm saying is to think that you have to enter manufacturing at the lowest end bring assembly into the country then we will grow in manufacturing slowly is missing the point that maybe this was the way to grow 30 years ago when china got into the business but increasingly global supply chains are so efficiently structured they do everything where it's most efficient to do it right so if you're subsidizing assembly with this pli scheme getting people to build uh, put together components in india don't be under the mistaken impression that if you do that suddenly a whole ecosystem will grow around that and build components this that everything as i said we already have a fight about components within the country that you know create the environment and people will come some people are coming just because they want to get away from china apple keeps saying that i don't know how much they actually doing in india but they're talking the talk and saying we'll bring a lot of manufacturing to india right now they're doing assembly in india good but let us be careful that the main way you get people in by creating an environment in which they can flourish that means improve the quality of labor so they want to hire people um you know improve logistics which the government is doing in, which means infrastructure logistics stop changing policies every few months right uh, because business people like to have a long term view uh you know don't erect tariffs one day cut it i mean remember we we erected tariffs on uh, laptops i mean laptops feed an entire industry as an input which is the service industry all those it people and suddenly you asking them like narayan murthy used to go to go to delhi to negotiate i want so many more laptops of this kind i mean that doesn't make any sense so have consistent reasonable policies don't keep going back and forth all those things will encourage manufacturing and we will have good entrepreneurs who will set up their manufa all those people you're talking about that's great but also recognize the world has changed that in every global supply chain we have assembly which is often the lowest value added part of the supply chain right the most value added part of the supply chain typically is not assembly but the early part of the supply chain or the production chain which is intellectual property when the apple iphone is created when steve jobs sits and thinks about how it will look when he puts in the ip that makes it work as well as it worked when it initially came out that's where the value is added so apple says designed in california doesn't say made in california apple hasn't made anything since 2004 it's all been done by foxconn okay apple's value it takes the initial part of the design process in the production chain it takes the last part which is marketing it the content which goes through the apps and uh, and this and that those two it owns it doesn't own anything in the middle which is the manufacturing process because it owns those two service ends it is worth 3 trillion dollars on a good day Foxconn on a good day is worth 50 billion. Apple is worth 60 times Foxconn even though Foxconn does all its manufacturing for Apple. That's the point we're trying to make that there are other parts. And that's not to say, you know, neglect manufacturing, but don't fetishize it. Don't give enormous subsidies to get the lowest end of manufacturing. We can move beyond that. If you subsidize but don't fix all the problems the you know the environment etc cetera, etc cetera, those people will leave i mean we had nokia manufacturing cell phones in the country what does manufacturing mean it was just assembling them putting components together eventually something happened and nokia left what was left behind nothing similarly if we don't build the necessary underlying infrastructure and ecosystem 
this could also evaporate. I'm not saying that's the first thing that will happen, but instead focusing on building the system, which means, again, I sound like a broken record, <laughs> healthcare, education, etc. Then try and get the R&D, the intellectual property, the entrepreneurship, which will create strong products for Indian companies. So how many years have we been in manufacturing automobiles? Since the early 1990s when we you know, lost Ambassador Fiat and uh, all that, and instead Suzuki, Hyundai, Hyundai, etc. took over. Has there been one distinctive Indian product which has captured the world? We make good products for India, but we haven't had one distinctive product which has... Where's our Indian Tesla? We haven't. That's what we should be ambitious about going forward. Yes, get the manufacturing, but focus on the intellectual property and design which creates Indian products that capture the world. And that requires an order of difference in how we do it, which is we need the universities, the, the university uh, industry combinations, etc., which create that kind of R&D. Take, take uh, Google. Google came... You know, uh, myth has it from Larry Brin and Sergey Page as, you know, doing, uh, I think it was a PhD thesis. Who was their advisor? It was actually an Indian, a guy called Motwani from IIT Kanpur. Now, if we brought a Motwani to India, instead of emigrating uh, because he was looking for a great university, if the great university could be in India, and Larry Page and Sergey Brin were Indian students, and were devising AI algorithms of one kind or the other and created a new product. Why not? We can do that, but we need to work on it. Do you think that this fetishization of manufacturing is because the government is trying to create jobs and if they promote the idea of manufacturing and lots of entrepreneurs come out and say, you know what, we've now created these big factories and manufacture products, yeah. you'll also be creating jobs so the government's problem will be getting solved. Is that the... I think I think certainly jobs are at 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 the heart of it that we want we need to do something in real time. The problem, of course, is that many of our jobs are being created in the service sector. These aren't these aren't all IT jobs or consultant jobs. Um, many of the jobs are cleaner, security guard. Those are the big service jobs that are being created. But those are still valuable jobs because they take somebody who has very low productivity in staying on the farm and gives them a better job in the city. And of course, if they come to the city and live, the kids can go to better schools and then the next generation becomes even better. But I think that more than that, we have the ability to transform people by improving the quality of their human capital, right? Right. You know, 50% of our graduates are unemployable, according to a um, survey by Webox. If we improve the quality of our colleges, right, if we made many more of them employable, the world is coming to India to look for these people because today those people can provide services at a distance. Today, for example, if you're doing IT, if you're doing um, legal uh, services, if you're doing consulting, if a consultant during the pandemic could offer service from Denver to Chicago, they can offer it from Hyderabad to Chicago today. And that's what a lot of global firms are discovering. We need people in India. And this is what are called global capability centers, which are emerging, doing R&D, doing, um, you know, Goldman Sachs has people building models for them in Bangalore. Uh, that's high quality work. So, over and above Indian products, entrepreneurship, IP, owning the high end, there's a lot of Indian services which can be exported directly. Now, how many jobs will that create? You know, a few million. Uh, the Tamil Nadu minister told me 10,000 jobs a month in these services I'm getting just off the bat. Now, that doesn't sound like much. Add it up, 120,000 jobs, but in one of 27 states. Multiply that by 10, 15, it starts becoming a serious job generation per year. But add to that, that each one of those jobs creates four or five jobs. That um, guy who gets a 15 lakh job uh, or 20 lakh job a year is going to have, uh, you know, other needs, uh, maybe a cook, maybe a, a maid. That uh, generates jobs for others. Now, 
hopefully over time those maids and cooks will improve their lot because they themselves their kids will get better so as a country you can grow uh, what i'm saying is you don't just need the jobs in manufacturing services can also provide you a tremendous number of jobs are you trying to say play to your strengths play in- to your strengths is exactly what i'm saying that we see the fact that we haven't grown manufacturing as a weakness yes but then note the fact that we've expanded in services as a strength and recognize that that strength can be expanded tremendously but you know let me give you another strength our democracy why don't people trust tiktok in the us today they think the chinese government has a way into the brains of their kids via tiktok that they will try and manipulate them this that maybe in blackmail you know a lot of stuff can happen our democracy and if we had strong sort of restrictions on government intervening in firms they couldn't ask the indian tiktok to open the gateways for the government to interfere if we had legislation like that our tiktok would be uh, you know respected around the world i mean what's a more concrete example of this 5g mm. we have a tejas a company in the south which is creating 5g network now why don't people trust huawei as 5g because they think the chinese government will build back doors to spy on the rest of the world what if our government you know passed a privacy law that you need a whole bench of judges and them to approve in order to try and uh, use back doors and they just said we're not going to build back doors they just would be a 5g network of choice for a lot of developing countries there's a lot of building on our strengths that we can do and we should be open to that and recognize our true strengths so i think traditionally our strengths have been the export of soft power that's on yoga uh, ayurveda all these things which are picking up in the west as well the second would be i think our international friendly nature that's at least the image that most uh, people have because the only other option for this kind of a geography with this kind of population is china people yeah. have turned away from it so yeah. that's one another advantage that we have the third one would probably be our intellectual capabilities right like this whole narrative about how the highest earning immigrant population in the us is indian it says something about the culture we come from also uh if you combine these three that's a likelier success in terms of business than just blindly going after manufacturing i uh, couldn't agree more i would say that you know you mentioned this this diaspora i think we should make much better use of our diaspora not just at rallies abroad or in sending remittances but we have to recognize as a talent pool there can we use that talent pool better for example one of the biggest problems in universities is faculty there not enough high quality faculty to go around but we have sent thousands tens of thousands of students abroad to become faculty in, around the world can we attract them back now immediately the point will be we can't pay them adequate salaries no we can because we also sending 7 and 1/2 lakh students every year abroad who are paying international rates to universities across the world if we created universities in india of that same caliber retain those students in india they would pay the universities higher fees we have to accept that for quality education you have to pay and it shouldn't be the government paying the private uh, sector universities can start up but that payment can be done by parents who want their kids to get a global education and these kids once they get that world class education can work for multinationals at a distance mm. doing consulting services from uh, you know uh, muzaffarpur or whatever uh, without going uh, you know all the way to to the west so uh, i think the the point is if you open your mind to the possibilities there are immense possibilities but it needs us to focus on doing some of these things uh, and you know imitate the good things in china china has built world class universities in the span of maybe a decade and a half by bringing back a lot of talent and populating with the existing talent those universities to create really sound when i look at students there used to be a lot of indian students coming for phd's in the in the us very few now partly because they're not interested but also partly because 
they're not of the same caliber as the Chinese students who come in now. We need to create our own universities which produce students of that caliber. A lot of my friends who've gone abroad want to come back. Don't want to raise their families in the US. That's right. a whole other conversation. Right. But a lot of them are willing to come back. I think the roadblock many of them face is uh, the salaries yeah. and their savings. But right. I would assume that, you know, after you take into account the whole lifestyle cost of living in America, figure out how much money they're saving there right. and figure out a way to pay them such that their savings match up to the savings that were happening in the US and a horde of Indians will come back. That, that was exactly the calculation we had when we set up the Indian School of Business here. Unfortunately, what happened in the initial years of the Indian School of Business is the entrepreneurs who were putting up the money got, uh, you know, hit by the dot-com bust. And uh, the initial endowments didn't come. But that was exactly the calculation. Match the savings, ensure they can send their kids to, uh, you know, a good university, and people will come. And, and, and I think what this means is you have to go beyond UGC salaries but you have to, uh, you know, be quite quite open about how much has to be paid. And it'll come back. It'll come back through because people are desperate for a good education here, which is why they're sending so many children abroad. I have a lot of hope in private universities. Like I've, I've gone to some private universities in India. Um, I've been to LPU. I was blown away by it. A friend of mine, Dr. Ritesh Malik, is associated with Laksha University. So I'm seeing the quality of education that's rising. I see that as a step in the forward direction. Yes. Uh, but I have to pull it back one last time to manufacturing, sir. Right. Say, just as a thought experiment, if you were the uh, Minister of Industries and you were told by the PM, listen, we need to increase the number of manufacturing uh, units in our country... Right. Or generally, the number of entrepreneurs who take up manufacturing in our country, what would you do? Well, you see, I, I think one, there's a broader set of issues we need to tackle, which is the quality of the labor force, whether they're trained to the right, these things. Make more industry uh, uh, sort of training institution combinations uh, and, and, and sort of essentially uh, ensure that, that they get the right people. That's one. But I would also go industry by industry and ask, what are your problems? Why are you not expanding? One of the biggest concerns I have is private investment in this country is not picking up. It's remained really low. What is lifting the economy is public investment, government investment. And that can't go on forever. It has really risen over the last few years, but it can't go on at that pace forever because we have a fiscal deficit also to worry about. So why? how can we get private investment? Why are you not investing more? What would it take to get you to invest more? What can I do as a government to make the framework better? Don't keep asking me for SOPs. Don't ask me for tariffs. Those are two things I'm not going to do. But if you ask me for how I can make it easier, reduce the, you know, the inspector burden on you, improve the uh, sort of your ease of getting permissions, um, improve common facilities. Maybe you, what you need is a, is a big tool room for all you small enterprises to use in order to uh, produce high... Maybe you need 3D printers. Let's talk about all that it would take in terms of broader support. Uh, maybe you need easy land. Those are the things I can work on, but don't keep asking me for more and more subsidies and more and more tariffs. That would be the kind of conversation that you have, should have industry after industry. And I think over time, you will get a sense of what the big common problems are, what the specific problems are. And the problems, you know, you fix the problem, as you said, you'll find it doesn't quite work. Then somebody will say, okay, we need... That's, you know, to some extent, that's how we worked at the RBI. We kept trying to change and then get feedback, change again. Arundhatir... Um, uh, Bhattacharya, who was the uh, RBI governor, used to come with a 10-page list of complaints. And he used to listen and uh, make changes. A-B testing yeah. of policy. I think you spoke about this in one of your past interactions. You said uh, that China does that very well. Like they'll A-B test policies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then depending on how the policy pans out, exactly they, they spread it across the country. This is cause, called crossing the river by feeling the stones. Mm. You can theorize all you want, but the theory has to hit the ground. And so you see what goes wrong with the theory when it hits the ground. And then adjust. 
and and i think we need more experimentation but not constant i mean if you constantly experiment industry says what's going on broad policy here it is within that policy uh, before rolling it out i'll experiment to see what what works best and then i'll roll out nationwide that kind of uh, you know being willing to see what works rather than theorizing i think is quite important for our policy establishment okay first and foremost thank you for your time you're most welcome from the bottom of my heart and from my team lads thank you for just your presence well thank you for having me and i wish your enterprise good luck you're contributing to the jobs solution and I hope you continue doing it for years to come i hope so sir it's actually a problem we're trying to solve through active businesses we're trying to figure how to rethink head hunting and all that in india because i've just figured that even for capitalistic goals you actually need to solve a problem in your country that's the easiest way to get all your capitalistic goals but i'm learning through people like you it's great this is like the best aspect of my life i get to meet people like you for living you giving me time and we're recording it so it's there forever thank you i hope to meet you again i hope i did justice to your time thank you so thank Appreciate you it. that was the end of our special conversation um his name has been on my dream guest list for the longest time so this was a huge personal achievement for me bringing him on uh the podcast the moment in the podcast where i personally felt the most validated was when sir said that our work is courageous it's a very conscious effort to keep it courageous i know that a lot of the podcasts piss off a lot of people and even that's done intentionally honestly i feel like you can't put forth your views in the public in 2024 without gaining some kind of trolling some kind of haters some kind of criticism and i also feel it's the real validation of anyone's work if you're only gaining pure unfiltered popularity in today's day and age in today's world it probably means that your work isn't as impactful as it can be that's just how i look at life of course there's a narrative about the fact that there's certain people with no haters but my question to you is that do those people put out all their opinions in the public domain if you are someone who puts out your opinions in the public domain in the same way that dr raghuram rajan does uh it will bring forth a lot of conversation around you so it's always my intention to have these edgy conversations on the show i totally know i can get into trouble but hey it's one life and i know that my intentions are clean i hope that we move into a better india a more educated india and a more steel manning oriented india not a straw manning oriented india a steel manning oriented india which understands the depth of both sides of the debate lots of love to you guys thank you for your support trs will be back very very soon we have a stellar lineup this month please give me your feedback on this episode as well i'm hungry for your feedback all the time we've improved because of your love and support keep loving us keep supporting us ranveer and the team we'll see you very soon lots of love namaste jai hind